All right, this morning, the topic is discernment. Uh, we're going to be, actually, if you want to open your Bibles, we'll get to it in a few minutes, but it's going to be looking at through the prophet uh, Jeremiah. It's what our scripture, but it's going to be a couple of minutes before we, we get to that. You know, uh, the actual term that I'll probably be using mainly is, is the gift of discernment. But technically, if you look in most of your, your versions uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is, is called distinguishing between spirits or, or discernment between spirits. And the, the reason I came up with it, this topic, because this, this past week I was uh, in a place uh, I listened to, uh, it was actually a prophetic word. It was a written prophetic word that was online. And basically it was saying that uh, it, it was actually called Great Days Are Coming Upon Your Nation, uh, the restoration of Donald Trump, uh, great prosperity was coming. Uh, and immediately when I read that, that verse out of Second Timothy came to mind about that in the last days people will acquire teachers who tickle their ears. Which brought me to the whole subject of discernment and distinguishing between the spirits. Because there's a lot of different voices that are speaking a lot of different things, whether it's in the world or even in the church at large, a lot of different things that almost seem to be many times opposite with each other. And we, we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, you know, there's nine gifts of the Spirit, you know, the gift of faith, the working of miracles, the gift of prophecy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, uh, tongues, interpretation, the gifts of healing. But probably one of the least ones we talk about is that gift of discernment or distinguishing of spirits. And yet it's something that we really need today because of all that's going on and all the different voices that are speaking and we need to be able to distinguish what is true and what is not true, what is of God and what's not. And that doesn't necessarily mean that someone is a, a false prophet. It just means that sometimes it may not, it could be, be the source, could be the Lord, it could be the enemy, it could be Satan, or it could just be out of their own selves. You know, sometimes, you know, I go back to, you know, before the election when so many, you know, there were prophetic voices saying that Donald Trump was going to be put in and, and uh, many of them had come back and, and, and admitted that they got carried away. Wasn't they were necessarily a false prophet as they were just almost proclaiming what they wanted to, to see happen. And I think we need to distinguish because there's a difference between simple prophecy for what we do here where we have a, you know, the Lord gives us a word for someone or gives us a picture, and we minister to people. And it says in 1 Corinthians 14, you know, it's for encouragement, it's for education, it's for comfort. Then when we begin to prophesy about national events, that's a whole different level. And there's a whole different accountability that goes with that. And so that's why we need uh, that gift of discernment and need to begin to pull on that. And I want to make sure also you understand that, you know, that gift of discernment is not the gift of a critical spirit, okay? You know, because that can easily happen. You know, that can switch and you can call it discernment when actually you're just being critical. And so we need to, to define that, all right? There's something um, some of you may be aware of or heard this term. It's called the Overton Window. And what that is, is uh, sociologists use it, uh, historians use it, futurists, friends, people use it. And what it is, is if you can picture a window, or really you could just say a box. And what is in that box is everything that is uh, not too radical. It's, you can be maybe either on the left or right side, but it's, it's not, it's, Nothing that's too radical that's out, of the, that's out of the window or out of the box that, that would be as accepted by the majority or, or, or a large percentage of the population. So, and within that box or within that window, 
you do have swings, like we'd say politically. You know, you have a one election and uh, the Democrats win, and then many times the pendulum is swinging the other way, and uh, the Republicans win, okay? So we, we see these, these shifts, and many times we think, well, it is swing back, but what we don't realize is that the whole window or the whole box, how you want to frame it, has moved. It has moved over the years and farther and farther to the left. It has um, accelerated greatly, especially in the last decade, and is increasing in moving that direction. So let me give you some examples, just, just from headlines. I saw this last week. There is a poll uh, done by Fox News that said a majority of registered Democrats, which was 59%, prefer socialism or communism to capitalism. And so that makes me think, okay, what would Harry S. Truman, you know, a president from our own state here, or even John F. Kennedy, both Democrats, would they even recognize the Democratic Party of today? Because that whole window has moved. Or in Oregon, I don't know if you realize this, this is something just happened this couple years, this, actually this year, they became the first state to de decriminalize drugs including heroin, cocaine, and meth. So we're not talking about marijuana. We're talking about hard drugs. They're, it's been completely decriminalized. Also, that happened this year in Oregon, to graduate high school, you no longer have to read or write or know basic math because it was considered discriminatory. So now you can graduate without knowing anything. Progress, again, we've moved. The LGBTQ, you know, would never have been in the Overton window 15 or 20 years ago. You know, and I believe, this is my personal belief, that when gay marriage was legalized under Obama, that we crossed the Rubicon, that there was no going back. You know, their, their whole agenda, if you, if you read some of their literature, was not really about gay marriage or even about equal rights. It was about the destruction of the institution of marriage. They wanted to get away, to completely destroy marriage where it doesn't matter whether you marry a dog or you have two or three people in your relationship or whatever, it, it's going back to the book of Judges where it says every man did what was right in his own eyes. So we've seen an, an acceleration of events. And we're beginning to see the birth pains, it was talks about in Revelation, that the birth pains are becoming accelerated, there's less time between them, and there's going to be more intense birth pains as time goes on. You know, Revelation 12.12 12 says, Satan is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. I saw an article out of, a, it was actually out of um, Charisma magazine, this or Newswire. This also was this past week. And it had some interesting things, and I thought I'd read a little bit of, of that, which kind of goes along with what we're talking about. But it says that Juliet Kamen, former President Barack Obama's Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security, called last week for the Biden administration to restrict the unvaccinated from flying by placing them on a no-flies list. Culture Marxist, Marxist, by all accounts, will not relent until America renounces all their freedoms over a virus that is 99.85% survival rate. 
And he goes on and he says, The chickens have finally come home to roost from secularism's century-long assault on the American culture, where an illusion, make-believe world is presented being propelled by alternate facts and conclusions. All the while, hunkered down between the four walls of the building with its trifling subculture, minuscule footprint in the culture, and firing blanks, American Christian has no detectable ability to address America's dissolution and demise, let alone counteract it. In plain English, American cities are looted and burned. Woke leftists promote defunding the police. President Biden and, and Speaker Nancy Pelosi call for another lockdown of the U.S. economy over a flu-like virus, and unaccountable politicians drown the nations with a veritable sink of red ink. The national debt currently stands at $28 trillion, the highest ever in American history, with government now paying people not to work. I'm not going to read all the article, but there's a very interesting part of this. He goes into a research that was done where after the Second World War, when we had the, the Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials where the Nazis, the high level of Nazis were, were being tried, okay, one such Nazi was Hermann Goring. He was almost the second leading Nazi. He was interviewed at the Nuremberg by Gustav Mark Gilbert, a German-speaking intelligence officer and psychologist who was granted free access by the Allies to all the prisoners held in the Nuremberg jail. In his 1950 book, The Psychology of a Dictatorship, attempted to profile dictator Adolf Hitler by using testimony from Goring and other Nazis. Gilbert's work is still a subject of study of many prominent universities, especially in the field of psychology. We got around to the subject of war, and I said that contrary to Goring's attitude, I did not think that common people are very thankful for leaders who bring them war and destruction. Why, of course the people don't want war, Goring shrugged. This is understandable. But after all, it's the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and, is always a, and it's always a simple matter to drag the people along. Whether it is a democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. In a democracy, countered Gilbert, these people have some say in the matter through their elected representatives in the United States. Only Congress can declare war. Oh, that is well and good, acknowledged Goring. But voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to do the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them that they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism, exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. Instilling an accurate and intent and imminent sense of danger, accompanied by authoritarian insistence on safety, togetherness, and compliance are the time-honored ingredients of a dictatorship. So I thought that had uh, some interesting things that I, I think affect where we are we are at today. Also on, on Wednesday of this week, I don't know if some of you have saw it, I think I would suggest that you go online and find this, but on Wednesday, Rick Joyner and uh, Chris Reed, uh, I know probably a lot of you are familiar uh, with them, but, but Rick Journey's been around for, I guess it's the early 80s, since I finally uh, started reading his stuff and, and hearing about him, and his prophetic voice. And uh, Chris Reed is a young guy. He's only, uh, you know, probably 40, uh, very prophetic. And uh, actually, he's going to be taking over for Rick Joyner. And uh, Chris Reed had had a... a, a dream on, I believe it was July 24th, 
And it had to do with uh, a red star and had to do with a crescent moon. And like I say, you can go online and listen to the whole thing. But it was something that would confirm something that we had heard clear back in the late 80s, almost maybe early 90s. It was from Paul Cain. Uh, many of you probably know Paul Cain. There's two prophets I really consider that were prophets, Paul Cain and, and, Bill, uh, and Bob Jones. But Paul Cain was saying at the time, and we were in the meeting when he said this, he said, and this was right at, you know, the, the Berlin Wall had fallen. So the Soviet Union was dissolving. It looked like communism was defeated. And he said, there's coming in the future a merger between Islam and communism. Now, it didn't really make sense to me because, for one thing, the, at that time, again, the Soviet Union was falling apart. And because communists are obviously, they're atheists, right? Why Islam is very religious. And so at that time, it really didn't make sense. But now, as we watch what's happening in Afghanistan, we've already seen that the Chinese have already moved in. While, you know, Afghanistan is a very poor country, <clears throat> but it is actually very rich in minerals especially rare earth minerals, which is why your cell phone works and why computers, all that stuff. Also lithium, which would be used for the batteries that, you know, everything's being switched over to batteries now. So they actually have a potential being a very rich country in that term. So the Chinese and Russians have already moved in there. We've also given, what, 80 some billion dollars worth of military uh, weapons, state-of-the-art things that are now in the hands of the Taliban, which will be in the hands of Al-Qaeda, which will be in the hands of Al-Shabaab and uh, ISIS and all the others. So they're going to be much more well-equipped, which tied into another dream that Rick Joyner had, had back in, uh, this would have been under, back when um, President Obama was president. And I remember it very clearly because it said it was one of his most disturbing dreams he's ever had, and it had to do with the southern border. And he said, if we didn't get the southern border under control, there was coming uh, terrorist attacks, uh, especially starting in Texas, but it would be spreading all over. And it was so horrific, the massacres that were going to come if we did not get the southern border under control. And obviously, you know, when President Trump came in, we were starting to move that direction. And all that has got away. And so he was very concerned about that, that we need to really be praying for protection, especially, and it's not limited to Texas, but Texas was going to be one of the first places. And literally massacres. I mean, it was, it was almost a combination of, of not only uh, terrorists coming across, but in alliance with the drug cartels. So there's some very uh, things that aren't seriously that are coming our way. And we really need to pray, pray about the southern border because these things are, are coming our way. Now, seven years ago, well, actually, it's eight years ago now. In fact, I had read this, part of this before you before, that Bob Jones, he's both Paul came and Bob Jones gone to be with the Lord. But he had sent this out uh, February 11th, 2013. Now, at the time when I got this, I thought, virus? Who's talking about a, what's a virus? What, what's a virus? Yeah, you know, what can happen with a virus? And it was called nothing but Jesus' blood. And the title of it was, It's time to plead the blood of Jesus over all viruses that are coming and the spirit of death. So again, this was February 2013, so almost seven years before it actually started a year ago. And it says, it's time we get back to teaching about the blood 
and pleading the blood of Jesus over our lives and especially over the viruses that are coming. These viruses can only be taken out by the blood of Jesus. It's time we plead the blood. over our houses because the enemy cannot enter and pass the blood. When the blood is on the lintels of the houses, none of the death spirits can trespass. The death spirit passes over the houses of all those who applied the blood to their doorstep on the night they came to kill the firstborn of Egypt. And he goes on and says, recently I saw there are two plagues coming to the global nations, especially the United States. One plague was influenza, while the other was like influenza in nature. Remember that severe in illnesses like influenza is represented by the scorpion. Thus, the serpent has been killing through influenza, while the scorpion-like influenza results are severe, severe illnesses that could kill you. By applying the blood of Jesus, we take authority over these plagues and cause them to die. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies, and they did not love their life to death. He goes on to say, we need inspired teachers to bring understanding about the advantage of applying the blood over our lives. Oftentimes, sickness enters through unrepentant sin in our lives. Now, each time the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we need to repent and put it under the blood of Jesus. Then it won't rise up against us and have an effect on our lives. The Lord has already given us authority, and this authority can only be worked through the blood of Jesus. There are too many old Christians dying off now who had this understanding of the blood. And many young ones are coming into authority, but they lack the understanding about the power of complete of the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that raises the dead, that heals the sick, cleanses the leopards, and casts out Satan out of the church. So again, this was seven years before it actually showed up. Again, another important prayer point to be praying the blood of Jesus over yourself, over your families, over your, you know, your extended families, over our church body, that we plead the blood of Jesus. Now, as Americans, I think we have a, a bias in that we generally think it will never happen here. But it's the same bias that, that Israel and Judah had. It won't happen here. So I want to start with our scripture reading in, in Jeremiah. And we're going to go through several sampling. Jeremiah chapter 5. Probably a half dozen in uh, Jeremiah. And then one in Ezekiel and one in the New Testament. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. This is the Lord speaking. He says, they have lied. He's talking about the false prophets. He says, they have lied about the Lord. They have said, he will do nothing. No harm will come on us. We will ne never see the sword or famine. The prophets are but wind, and the word is not in them. So let what they say be done to them. Now, chapter 7, verse 4. Now, this is just an interesting one, I thought. But let me read this way. It says, Do not trust 
in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So what they were saying was, this is where the temple's at. This is Jerusalem. This is where the, the temple is at. This is where, you know, we have the, the commandments. We have the, the covenant. Uh, and it's interesting that, and this is, destruction came in 586 B.C., but even in 70 A.D., when the Romans did this, Josephus tells us they were saying the same thing. It won't happen here. The temple, the temple is here. We are the people of the covenant. It's not going to happen. And destruction came upon them. One, I, uh, there's one, I want to, oh, yes. It's in that same chapter, 7, 7 11, good, one, easy one to remember. And it says, Has this house which bears my name became, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Now remember when Jesus went into the temple and he drove out the money changers, what did he say? He's quoting this, you have made it a den of robbers. Now chapter 8, verse 10, 11, again just kind of sampling. Read all the prophets as far as that goes. I will say, give you the warning, if, if that's all you read, then all you're going to see is judgment and warnings. So we have to balance that, you know, that all out. Verse 10, Therefore I will give their wives to other men and their fields to new owners, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wounds of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Okay, chapter 14. In verses 11 through 16. And that's one thing I pray that we are not yet here. Because it says, Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cries. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, the famine, and plagues. But I said, O oh, Sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own mind. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. These same prophets will perish by the sword and famine. And the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out of the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. There will be nowhere to bury them or their wives, their sons, or their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. Now, fun stuff. Chapter 23. And starting verse 16, Lord says, Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All, oh, I'm sorry, 16. I'm in the wrong place. Well, I'll go back to 15. Therefore, 
This is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisonous water because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hope. They speak visions from their own minds, not from their mouths of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of you has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath. And you can go ahead and finish the, the rest of that. But that's why it's so important that we know and use that gift of discernment, distinguishing the spirits, and know what is of the Lord and what is not. What the media is saying, what world leaders are saying, and what the truth is. So we need to be listening, asking the Lord for that gift. Chapter 25 Verse 3, one short verse. It says, For 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. So for 23 years, he was speaking warning over and over again. And really, he only had two converts. There's an Egyptian guy and broke the, his, his scribe because it wasn't popular. Who wants to hear that message? I don't want to hear bad news, gloom and doom, we would say, but we need to hear the truth. Now, the next prophet over, you, you have Jeremiah, then you have uh, Lamentation, which is also Jeremiah. Just go to the next one, though, is Ezekiel. Just one verse out of it. But it gives you a kind of a sample. And you can really go through any of the prophets and, and pick out almost the same things. But in v verse 10, he says, of chapter 13, he's talking about the false prophets. He said, because they lead my people astray, saying peace, when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it up with whitewash. Therefore, tear those who cover it with whitewash that is going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will still send hell storms hurling down, and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, the people not at, will the people not ask you, where is the whitewash you washed with? And one more in the Old Testament, Micah, prophet of Micah, one of the minor prophets. Micah 2, verse 11. He's kind of being a little sarcastic here. He says, I will prophesy... For you plenty of wine and beer. He would be just the prophet for this people. So I'm going to prophesy for you plenty of wine, plenty of beer, and that would be just the prophet for this people. And also in chapter 3 of Micah, verse 11 and 12, he says, her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortune for money. Yet they, lean upon the, yet they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, the temple hill a mound of overgrown thickets. 
And again, you can go through all the minor prophets and major prophets, and you get the same theme, basically. Time of warning, wake up people. This is what's on the doorstep. And like with uh, Jeremiah, you know, he says, I've been telling you this for 23 years. It's not like the Lord gives a warning, and then all of a sudden, in a year's time, it happens. It's like he gives plenty of time, continue to get the word out, where people have plenty of opportunity to turn their ways back to the Lord. Now, I want to go to one in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 23. And we're going to start in verse 37. It's the very end of the chapter. And so Jesus is prophesying. He's, this is right before, obviously, chapter 24, which is a sign of the times, sign of the end of the age. And he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this is addressed to the leadership of Judah to Israel, to Jerusalem. Your house is left to you desolate. How often I had wanted to gather you as a chick. And again, as we look at, at uh, just, just, just so, Jehoshaphat, Josephus, as he was actually there in 70 AD when, when uh, Jerusalem was, was captured by the by the Roman army under Titus, and those who weren't killed were taken in a slave's captivity. The temple was completely destroyed. But it didn't happen the next day after Jesus prophesied this, because depending on when there's different arguments of when Jesus died, whether it's 33, whether it's 35. But we know for sure that it was A.D. 70 when the temple, so there's, you got at least a 30, you know, 35-year period before the event actually happened. And it, uh, Josephus also records and says that the Christians heeded chapter 24, where it says, when you see armies surrounded Jerusalem, <clears throat> flee, leave, and that they left as the Romans began to capture. And so the, the Christian, uh, Jewish Christians did flee, and they survived it. But over a million Jews, they say, was, was killed during that time because it was the time of the feast, and so the city was, was filled uh, way beyond its normal population. So that sounds like a lot of, of bad news. But I think it's, it's something that we just need to be aware of. This is what's going on. This is what's happening in our day and our time, and this is why we need to hear what the Lord is saying. What, what is that gift of discernment distinguishing the between spirits? There's a lot of voices out there in, in the world. There's a lot of voices in the, in, in the church. And we need to be able to discern, okay, Lord, what are you saying? What is your heart? Now, there's some positive things going on at the same time. You know, in Luke uh, 18, 27, the Lord says, for nothing is impossible with God. So things can be turned around. But I kind of see it as, you know, it, it's that, again, the best of times and the worst of times, it's, uh, you know, the day of the Lord is called, it's, it's called great and terrible. Well, which is it? Well, it's both. It's great and it is terrible. We want to make sure we're on the great side of that equation, but it's going to be terrible for a lot of people. It also says, lift up your head when you see these things, knowing your redemption is drawing nigh. I read to you last week about uh, 
what happened there that Sonny had sent a text about, you know, that one of the churches in Church on the Rock who each year has a, a banquet for all the football players in the city, and they had 600 who attended. And they have a banquet, and then they have a, a service, they have worship, and then they have a, a time of invitation. And so of these 600 high school football players, 300 came forward and gave their lives to the Lord. So that's, that's a huge thing. So we begin to see the, the trickles of revival beginning to happen. Lives that are being changed. Uh, again, in, this, uh, in June of this coming year, at Arrowhead Stadium, there's going to be the Send, which is going to be a great Christian event. That stadium will be sold out, and it will be rocking with worship and praise and seeing the Lord move. So there are a lot of positive things happening. And the most positive thing is that we need to remember Revelation 11, 15, which says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So despite how bad things may get at times in the future, we keep that in mind. We win. You know, there's going to be a lot of battles we may lose, but we win the war. But it's so important that we have that gift of distinguishing the spirits because there's going to be a lot of things going on now, a lot of different voices. I was, we were with some friends uh, Friday for lunch, and they were telling me about this new uh, thing move in the church that was called oneness, and I was, what? I never heard of it. But what they were saying was, well, rather than believing in the Trinity, they believe that that uh, they can only the Godhead can only manifest itself in one time in history. So, in other words. This is like the time of Jesus. So, uh, in other words, rather than have a, a concept of the Trinity, it's like, no, it's, you know, it's not the Father, it's not the Spirit, it's not the Son. They're all separate, and they can only manifest at one time. You know, it's like, I never heard of such a thing. So there are different things that are going on, even within the body of Christ, that we have to be very careful of stay online because the enemy is trying to get in and bring division for one thing, but just bring false teaching on some things. You know, the, the progressive Christianity that's going on also now, you know, that kind of does away with all the, well, it's not all sin, we're all under grace, we can just do what you want to do. Uh, so there's a lot of a misrepresenting the truth of God's Word. And so we need that, that gift of distinguishing and there should be something that comes up and you and go, well, oh, that's a little red flag. All of a sudden goes, something's wrong. You know, this isn't right. And so of all the gifts we have, of those nine gifts, those, and they're all supernatural gifts. I mean, it's not like word of knowledge and not, uh, word of wisdom. It's not because you were born with a high IQ. It was born because the Lord gives you a supernatural download of a specific time, a specific event. And it's the same with distinguishing of spirits. Okay, who is saying, what, what's the spirit behind the agenda that is being driven? And so we really need that gift of distinguishing a spirit. And my, I don't want to seem to be also, you know, make sure not bringing any fear, but I'm also trying to wake you up to the reality of where we are at and things that are going to be happening. And realize, so you're not shaken when those things begin to happen. That you're ready, and you know, Isaiah 60, you know, rise and shine when great darkness covers the people. Rise and shine because your light's going to shine that much greater in the time of great darkness. When people are ask, looking for answers, where everything seems out of control. And so we have an expectancy, we need to have ears to hear eyes to see what the Spirit is saying, what the Spirit is doing. Because it's a, it's a very intense time. But also take comfort in the fact that God knew you would be alive at this time. 
And so he has a plan. He has a purpose for you. He, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you, regardless of what's going on, the craziness of the world. He is our refuge. He is our place of peace. He can do miracles. You don't need a miracle until you need a miracle, right? He can do those miracles, provide what you need, and use you to further your kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord. So, rather than be discouraged, I want you to be encouraged, knowing that it's for such a time as this that, you were, that you're here, that you have breath, that you have life. And so, we're not going to be shaken when everybody else is, is, is shaking and, and, and looking for answers. We're going to have the answers.